once again. <laughs> Good evening and warm shalom from the University of Central Florida, where I are a professor in the Judaic Studies program. Hanson, Judaic Studies. Hanson, Judaic Studies. Who else would you hire? to teach everything Jewish from Avraham Avinu, from Abraham all the way up to the present, and of course the modern Middle East. Who else but a red-headed fellow of Scandinavian extraction named Hansen? And people are always coming up and asking me, what was it, Dr. Hansen, that propelled you into this particular field, this discipline, this line of inquiry? And invariably I chalk it up to a very rare virtually extinct creature as we enter into and course through the 21st century. Perhaps you've heard of this, this creature, this, this almost extinct animal, intellectual curiosity. Anybody vaguely, <laughs> vaguely heard of that? I just let my intellectual curiosity lead me. <coughs> All right, Hanson, come on, come on out with it. What's the real story? Okay, I'll level with you. True, absolutely true. Long ago, when I was just a kid, growing up in the suburbs of Chicago, I saw Ben-Hur, all right? <laughs> you know, Charlton Hester, and you got the Romans, and there's, there's sea battles, and chariot races, and my goodness, swords and sandals. And I was just hooked. You know, when other kids were out playing football, chasing girls. I was down in my basement building an archaeological model of the Roman Forum. I kid you not. As I got a little older, I graduated to building a facsimile of King Herod's temple in ancient Jerusalem. It just got in the blood. What can I say? I can't explain it. And when I was making my way through college, University of Illinois, Chicago, I decided to spend my senior year abroad, picked up bag and baggage, and plunked myself down from Chicago all the way to Tel Aviv, Israel. Plunked myself down, having never before ventured out of the continental United States save for a single afternoon in Tijuana. <laughs> was it? Massive culture shock, knew not a word of Hebrew except shalom, that was it. Massive culture shock, almost came home, but I'd come halfway around the world to study ancient Near East history. And I enrolled myself in a little nondescript school for Americans nestled among the trees right here on Mount Zion. How would you like to live on Mount Zion? Hey, we're the Zionistas, right? I lived on Mount Zion. Just an evening's stroll away from this place. Literally, just walk there in the evening. You know what this is? Here's the Kotel, the Western Wall, and of course, the Temple Mount. And I used to think to myself, what a city this is, home to serious historical emblems of the three great monotheistic faiths, Judaism, Islam, the Al-Aqsa Mosque right here in the Dome of the Rock. If you head over this way, just a ways, you find a grayish dome of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where long ago Jesus of Nazareth was crucified and entombed. And incidentally, there are a lot of bogus archaeological sites peppered across the land of Israel. This one is the real McCoy, no question about it. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre. All within walking distance, and I used to think to myself, wouldn't it be nice if we could all just get along? <laughs> 
wouldn't it be nice? There is such potential in this land. I threw myself in to the study of the ancient Near East. Not just sitting in the library with musty books. We were out there visiting archaeological sites every week. And then I enrolled in a language institute for Hebrew, sponsored by the government of Israel for new immigrants coming in from all over the world. No common language, of course. Half of my class was Russian. The only Russian I knew was Nyet. Wondering, how'd you get out of Russia? Of course, no English spoken in that class from day one. It's the way it goes. Five hours a day, five days a week. From the very first Shalom, you learn Ivrit, you learn Hebrew. After several months of that, you're either quite fluent or in a hospital. What? <laughs> and I really tumbled on to my new language. I suppose I was one of the more fortunate ones. Threw myself into it. One day, found myself walking into the great rotunda of an annex of the Israel Museum of Jerusalem called Hechal HaSefer, the Shrine of the Book, and just marched into the center of this awesome place of poured sculpted concrete with an enormous dome shooting up and smack in the center, the great scroll of the book of the prophet Isaiah unrolled round the inner rim of an enormous glass case. Just months before, it would have been all chicken scratch. All Hebrew to me. When I walked up, found my bearings, and in no time, I was reading the Dead Sea Scroll of the book of the prophet Isaiah. And right then and there, I decided, I'm going to do something more with this modern yet ancient language. And you took Isaiah and you plunked him down in modern Tel Aviv. He'd be a little confused. You know, how do you say Televisia and, you know, things like uh, Radio Glida, which is ice cream. But by and large, you know, he could get along. So I purposed I was going to go on to grad school and study Hebrew language and literature, focusing on the Dead Sea Scrolls with an all-Israeli faculty. Used to call them FBI, foreign-born Israeli. Never spoke a word of English to my own professors the whole time I was in grad school, such a fanatic. And to this day, the lingua franca in our Judaic studies program over at UCF is Hebrew. Hebrew, we speak to each other in Hebrew. But during my long odyssey, I returned to the land of Israel. Here was the institute where I first plunked myself down and started studying. But I returned to Israel in the 1980s, working for a little ragtag American television outfit that had built a TV station in South Lebanon, a town called Marjayun, South Lebanon. Now, it was owned and operated by the Family Channel, and I think they just wanted to do something good and broadcast some wholesome, family-oriented television to a war-torn area, which it was, still is. Our crew lived in northern Israel, northern Galilee, a town called Kiryat Shmona, but we commuted over a hostile border every day to our TV station in Lebanon, wearing a flak jacket. And my job was to sit in this TV station with a very primitive power grid, mind you, and broadcast family-oriented television with Arabic subtitles. I am the man who brought Bonanza to the Middle East. <laughs> and all Haas Cartwright comes lumbering on the set. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> sort of thing. But we never knew what was going to transpire any particular day. Our town 
had been subject to Katusha rocket attacks for many, many years. And everybody had stories what it was like to be just sitting in your living room, sipping a cup of tea, and all of a sudden you'd hear it, a rocket whistling in over the hills to the west. Everybody duck and cover, this horrific boom, and all the windows shake and rattle. Sometimes they broke. You never knew where they were going to land, sometimes in an open field, sometimes in a schoolyard. There were casualties. And then everybody has to go down into the bomb shelter. Every house has a bomb shelter. This is the center of town right here. Katusha rocket landing. And, and here it is off in the, in the hills. Let's head down to the bomb shelter. Sometimes you've got to stay down there for days. And that was behind Israel's decision to invade Lebanon. They called it Mibza Shlom HaGalil. Operation Peace for Galilee. And it did bring peace for Galilee, at least for a time. At least while our TV station was up in Lebanon. There was a little, Israel called it, Ratsuat Abitachon, a security zone, for want of a better translation, in conjunction with the Christian Lebanese, South Lebanon. And our TV station was sort of the mascot media center for that little security zone. So I commuted across the border up to Marjayun, Lebanon, in an area they used to call the Good Fence, right on the border with Lebanon. Why'd they call it the Good Fence? Here's the, the Lebanese flag. Because Israel had a policy. We're going to allow Lebanese from this security zone to come in and work in Northern Galilee is day laborers. You get paid here. It's great. It's a good gesture. It's a mitzvah, a good deed. And go back to Lebanon, and Israel will help provide security in this zone to keep those Katusha rockets as far away from Kiryat Shmona as possible. Unfortunately, that security zone is gone as we speak today. And that little Christian Lebanese enclave has been crushed. No more good fence. We have some of the most radical elements sitting right on the border today. Hezbollah, armed to the teeth with sophisticated weaponry and rockets. But this was our town in those days where our TV station was, Marjayun, Lebanon. Here was the border crossing. The IDF, Israeli Defense Force, crossed the border every day in convoys, and I was in a Jeep Cherokee right behind them in my flak jacket. I was the only guy on our team who could really speak Hebrew, and the Israeli colonel in that area, Colonel Dani, everybody called him. Everybody's on a first name basis, even the, the military, even the officers. Dani, it's my job to get permission, official little slips of paper that allowed us officially to go back and forth across that border. So I was a liaison with the IDF in those days and went right across this border. And one afternoon I'm sitting there and Hoss Cartwright's doing his thing and the walkie-talkie comes alive and they're, they're saying, get down to the border Immediate, grab the beta cam, get to the border, something's happened. And wouldn't you know, an incident. A teenage Lebanese girl of Shia extraction, her head full of who knows what kind of propaganda, got in a pickup truck loaded with high explosives and drove herself into one of those convoys. And the explosion instantly killed 13 Israeli soldiers and wounded I don't know how many more. And this was the most horrific job task I ever had to do, most horrific thing ever to be called. I had to grab a beta cam, head out 
to the hillside and stand up there with the United Nations, of course, the observers. And I had to video the aftermath of this thing. I mean, your heart just breaks, you bleed, just looking at it. And soldiers were hopping out of those helicopters and across the hillside, across the valley, actually. I had been on the same road just an hour before. And they're out on the cross the valley with big plastic bags. And you guess what went in the plastic bags? So I had to video the aftermath of this thing. The uh, IDF came by and then seized my videotape. And we spent the rest of the day trying to get the video back, which the IDF promptly delivered to us when we explained our purpose. And immediately it was uploaded, sent back to the States where it was a video exclusive. What a way to get an international scoop. But this is what Israelis live with all the time. This is what the IDF lives with all the time. Even if you're right in the heart of Israel, in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, you never know when somebody, some crazed maniac is going to get in a truck and plow into you, which just happened in the last week or so. Now, one of my buddies up in Lebanon was a Christian fellow by the name of Bill from Ohio. And he'd heard about this horrific civil war in Lebanon. And rather than just read about it, he wanted to do something. So he'd done pretty well. He was an engineer in electronics and television, wouldn't you know? And he decided to pull up roots and replant himself in Marjayun, Lebanon, with his family, bought a big sprawling house in Marjayun, Lebanon, and just started inviting little orphaned Lebanese kids into his home and essentially created his own private orphanage. And so many children having lost both parents in this endless civil war in Lebanon. You know, you see it on the news, but what are you going to do? He, he did something. He used to say to me, Ken, the Lord said, go ye. <laughs> Didn't necessarily say, come back. And Bill would help us out whenever we lost power, which was not infrequent in Lebanon. Just everything, boom, go out. How do we get Hoss back on his horse? Bill! And he'd help us crank up the generator and get the thing going. He told me that he had been warned repeatedly to get out of Lebanon. Now, no way I would live in Lebanon. Kiryat Shmona, okay, it's Israel. Every, every evening, driving back in my Jeep Cherokee, as soon as I hit the border, back into Israel was... <laughs> and we didn't have a few Katusha rockets, but just don't want to be in Lebanon. Not Bill, it's Lebanon. And one evening, while he was having his devotions with all the little Christian Lebanese orphans, some folks came to his door barged in, and they, they grabbed his wife and all the little kids, took him into one bedroom, tied him up, and they grabbed my buddy Bill, dragged him into the bathroom, and proceeded to put one bullet in his back and one in his neck, and left him in a pool of his own blood. And the next day, guess what? Another international scoop as they're carrying Bill with a sheet over him out of his house in Lebanon. That's what it's like. It's a tough neighborhood. And yet, we never let go of hope. Hence, the national anthem of the State of Israel, which is Hatikva. Hatikva, the hope.
And I love how it ends. Liot am chovshi ba'artsenu. To be a free people in our land. Eret Zion v'Yerushalayim. The land of Zion. Zionistas. And Jerusalem. We always affirm life, even in a tough neighborhood. In Kirat Shmona, we lived in an Orthodox building, and our neighbor right across the door from us was an Orthodox rabbi. He lost his brother. He lost his brother in the Lebanese war. And yet, he said, we do this. We, we are here. We're not going anywhere. I, I am not stricken over what happened to my brother. We are here. We are staying. And yes, the war was worth it. Unbelievable. An affirmation of life. And yet, the madness is spreading well beyond this tough neighborhood. And we're looking from the Middle East now across the whole of Europe. Greece, 2011. Corfu. Very interesting town. Been to Corfu. The synagogue there set on fire, burned. Torah scrolls. And this is something out of Nazi Germany. Torah scrolls burned? Anti-Semitic graffiti is all over the country. This kind of stuff. Juden. Star of David. And some particularly profane graffiti as well. Only 100, 150 Jews are left today in Corfu. And only 8,000 in the whole of Greece. Which comes to point. 0.8% of the population. Synagogues have been vandalized and burned pretty much all over Europe. Anti-Semitic inscriptions. Not always good English. All Jewish must die. What do we have here? Swastika on the wall. Things like this taking place in Paris, Madrid, Amsterdam, London, Berlin, Rome. Hard to believe. Jewish cemeteries desecrated. Swastikas. And Jews being attacked in the streets. Even have an anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist group here performing. In Holland, there are police decoys, believe it or not. How do you find the bad guys in Amsterdam, the anti-Semitic agitators? Well, you dress up as an Orthodox Jew. This guy's a policeman. <laughs> decoys dispatched to try to do something about this resurgence of anti-Semitic attitudes and violence across Europe. If you're Jewish in Europe today, it's probably a good idea not to wear a kippah, a yarmulke. Kosher restaurant owners in Europe have actually decided we better close shop during their big street protests. You know there are a lot of big street protests across Europe, usually hard left in political orientation, and usually having to do with the, the G8 or who knows what. Nothing to do with Jews or Israel. But if you're a kosher restaurant owner, you better get ready. No matter what the demonstration is about, better close up shop. Even if the protest is about wages or retirement issues or whatever, the agitation is always there. If you got a Jewish name, uh, you might think of changing it. And look what sprouts up in some of these street protests. 
even if they're about wages or retirement or the G8 summit or whatever, you get signs like this, which is increasingly prevalent across Europe. We see a lot of this exact sign. What's it mean? Star of David equals swastika. What's that mean? It means that the new genocidal maniacs, today's Nazis, are the Jews, the Zionists. In Paris, it's a certain Jewish cafe right on the Avenue of the Republic, nice location. Demonstrators came by, booing, shouting, Jews, Zionists, always conflated. Jews, Zion if you're Jewish, you must be a Zionist. A man leaving the cafe was physically assaulted, and then came a Molotov cocktail right into the cafe. Because it's a Jewish cafe. And who can forget? not so long ago, the Charlie Hebdo attack, right in Paris. 2015, not so long ago, and culminating in an attack on a certain Paris supermarket where hostages were also taken, a siege going on in the hyper kosher supermarket. Kosher, kosher, kosher supermarket. Now, how did the American administration handle this? Well, the, the, the point is this. My first job is to protect the American people. It is entirely legitimate for uh, the American people to be deeply concerned when you've got a bunch of uh, violent, vicious zealots uh, who behead people or randomly shoot uh, uh, a bunch of folks uh, in, a, in a deli in Paris. Randomly shoot a bunch of folks <laughs> in a deli. A deli in Paris. This was not a random shooting of a bunch of folks in a deli in Paris. This was an attack on a kosher deli. Does the president have any doubt that those terrorists attacked that deli because there would be Jews in that deli? You know, uh, it is clear from the, the, the terrorists and some of the writings that they put out afterwards what their motivation was. Uh, the adverb that the president chose uh, was used to indicate that the individuals who were killed in that terrible, tragic incident were killed not because of who they were, but because of where they randomly happens to be. These individuals were not targeted by name. This is the point. But by by religion, were they not? Well, John, I, the, there were people other than just Jews who were in no. that that deli. No, that deli was attacked. It was a kosher deli. It's no, not John, any I, random deli. No, it was a kosher deli. I answered the question once. I answered the question once. Does the administration really believe that these people, that the, the victims of this attack were, were not uh, singled out because they were of a particular faith? Well, as you know, I believe if I remember the victims specifically, there were, there were not all victims of one background or one nationality. Okay. Thank you, Jen Psaki. All right. Well, does the administration believe that this was an anti-Jewish uh, attack on... Jewish community in Paris. I don't think we're going to speak on behalf of French authorities and what they believe was uh, the situation at that point here. Yeah, but if a guy goes into a, a, a kosher market and starts shooting it up, you know, he's not looking for Buddhists, is he? <laughs> well, again, and I think it's relevant that obviously the individuals in there who were shopping and working at the store. Well, one expert, who does the administration expect shops that in kosher? I mean, <gasps> I might, but, you know, an attacker going into a store that is clearly identified as being 
one of, you know, as, as identified with one specific thing. I'm not sure I can understand how it is that you can't say that this was a this was I a just don't event. have more for you, Matt. It's an it's a issue for the French government to address. Issue for the French government to address. Oh, yes, let, let the French do it. And the rampaging anti-Semitism across Europe is, of course, alive and well in Russia, where I happen to have some personal experience being married to a Russian who is from the third largest city in Russia called Novosibirsk. It's in Siberia. And by the way, I was just in Novosibirsk, Siberia, just returned less than two weeks ago. But I was there visiting my wife's family not too long ago. And in that same city, Novosibirsk, Siberia, in March 1999, not that long ago, there was a pogrom. You thought the pogroms were over. Think again. They came into the synagogue of Novosibirsk, ransacked it, desecrated Torah scrolls, prayer books, trampled, trampled them, destroyed furniture, and Nazi graffiti sprayed on the walls. Well, after our visit in Novosibirsk, of course, I'm an American. I want to get back to the States. We decided to take the Trans-Siberian Railroad. How fun. The Trans-Siberian Railroad, all the way from Siberia, in this case to St. Petersburg, three days and three nights of misery. Here I am. And uh, the, the train would stop at various towns and hamlets along the way. And the poor passengers would get out and try to st stretch our legs. Uh, and some people would, would buy certain food items, but just looking at the rancid fish, I didn't, I didn't. But my wife looks at me and she says, um, <clears throat> get back in the train. And by the way, change your t-shirt. I was, you know, it's hot in that train, even though it's, it's, you know, it's blazing cold outside, freezing cold, I should say, but stuffy and everything. I'm wearing my favorite kosher t-shirt. <laughs> and some, somebody behind me had said in Russian, he said, Ivri um, at Israel. He's a Jew from Israel. What, do I really look like a Jew from Israel? I just made that comment, and um, my wife said, you know, it's probably, probably a good idea not to be wearing that. But, but it is rampant across Europe and to points east all across Russia. There it is in Russian. You know, after the end of the Second World War, it seemed to a good many people that European anti-Semitism had at the very least seriously diminished. Hitler was defeated. It wasn't really cool to be an anti-Semite in Europe. I mean, there, there still were around, but seriously, anti-Semitism in continental Europe in the wake of the Second World War had diminished. But it's back. And here's my theme for the evening, and this is what I want us all to remember, if we remember nothing else, in order to try to make sense of what is happening today. It's a simple theme, and it's pretty easy to stick it in our heads. Anti-Semitism today is not the same as Nazi anti-Semitism. Why is that? Because it's emanating, really emanating, out of the Middle East, but it's not different either. It's not the same, but it's not different. That's my message. Why is it not different? 
because even in the Hitler era, you know, there were serious contacts between Nazi officials, Hitler himself, and certain Middle Easterners, like the Grand Mufti. And seriously, anti-Semitism drifted to the Middle East, even during the Nazi era. And a lot of Nazi-type anti-Semitism was embraced and adopted in certain Middle Eastern countries. So while anti-Semitism waned in Europe post-war, it was growing in the Middle East. And now it's coming back into Europe again from the Middle East. Get it? Not the same and not different. Prominent in Muslim countries, to be sure. Influenced by the old anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, we should emphasize, really is a European thing. And if we want to get academic about it, one could make a case that it really is, hate to say it, a Christian thing. Not to engage in Christian bashing by any means, but where did anti-Semitism arise? Where did anti-Judaism arise? Well, there was anti-Judaism even in the Greek and Roman world. There was. There are Roman authors who wrote scandalous things saying, you know, the Senate, the Roman Senate are full of Jews, full of Jews. So there, there were nasty things said about Jews, but there were also positive things about Jews in the classical world. There were tens of thousands, some, some feel as many as a million, non-Jews, Greeks and Romans, who flocked to synagogues, didn't convert. They called them God-fearers. But they loved and respected Judaism. So the phenomenon of anti-Semitism, we can't really peg it on Greeks and Romans. It wasn't until Rome became Christianized under a fellow named Constantine, or to him, who opened the floodgate of Christianizing Rome, that the intolerance began to grow. Maybe, perhaps, because it was recognized that Judaism and Christianity really are so close, so closely wed, but it was incumbent upon the Christians of Europe to establish that we're right and the Jews got it wrong. They missed their Messiah. So for centuries and centuries, Jews experienced horror in Christian Europe. No question about it. That's the old anti-Semitism. Jews were called Christ killers. But then this spreads to Muslim countries. It wanes in Europe, spreads to Muslim countries, and now goes back into Europe via Muslims coming into Europe. Not the same and not different. Anti-Semitism somehow resonates as well in non-Muslim populations in Europe. It's kind of a symbiotic relationship from Europe to the Middle East and back to Europe. And it's present today among the far left and the far right as well in today's Europe and Russia. Then, case in point, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a notorious historical fraud alleging that there is a secret cabal, a conspiracy of very well-placed, well-heeled, rich Jews who are secretly conspiring to dominate the whole world through finance. And this secret protocol records the conversations of these rich Jews talking among themselves what we're going to do, how we're going to infiltrate all sections of society and, and take control of the world. Notorious fraud. It originated where? In Europe. 
picked up by a certain automobile mogul in the United States named Henry Ford and publicized over here in his periodical. But where do we find the protocols today? In the Middle East, all over the Middle East, in Arabic. It's also in European languages, and it's all over the Internet. Here we have it in French. Here we have it in, in Espanol. Los protocolos de los sabios de Sion. There it is in Spanish. And of course, in Russian. Sionsky protocol. That's it. Sionsky protocol in Russian. It's all over the place. And it's believed as factual today in the Arab street. We believe it's true. We believe it's uh, something is hidden with the, you know, the Jewish allies, the old Jewish allies, uh, they are hidden something in order to prepare for the to create a threat to come. Some people say it's just a story. Some people say what is happening actually right now. Damascus, right? They want to rule our country here, those Jews, and occupy. Do you hear Jews talking that way about Muslims? Syrian TV series, Al Shatat, broadcast on Iranian TV, The Legacy of Amshel Rothschild. This new anti-Semitism echoes the old anti-Semitism in the fact that it demonizes Jews. Jews are truly wicked. They're demonic. They're evil. And oddly enough, the Islamic view of the state of Israel has, in fact, become the European view of the state of Israel. Israel is, after all, a colonial power. 
Israel's colonial settlement policy. Israel has expropriated land. Just look at how much land the Palestinian people have lost over the years. Reduced to little enclaves within the larger Jewish entity. Israel is an artificial state knocking down Arab homes, the big wrecking ball, even while it builds more settlements. Never mind the Jewish historical presence in the land of Israel for the last 3,000 years. Never mind all of that. Not only the wall, which by the way, is no longer a Jewish site, according to the United Nations. Never mind the archaeological evidence all over the land of Israel of Jewish presence here. Never mind the much less legitimate colonial Arab states. You want to talk about colonialism? Where did the Arab states come from? Who decided on the borders of the Arab states? Wasn't that the European powers? But we have politically correct journalism, of course. And above all, you must not insult Islam. So the new anti-Semitism hides behind an assault on Zionism, on Israel. Of course, it's not cool to be a bigot or a racist, so we're not going to admit that we're anti-Semites. We're just anti-Israeli, of course, anti-Zionist. And if you criticize us, well, then you're a racist. You're insulting Islam. The whole world is divided, after all, among those who are oppressors and those who are oppressed. And I think that goes a long way toward explaining the whole politically correct phenomenon. And am I wrong in suggesting that this whole concept, all of humanity equals oppressors and oppressed, am I wrong in suggesting that that is more than just a little bit Marxist in orientation? And if you are among the oppressed, then you get a pass. No matter what your behavior is, you get a pass because you're the oppressed class. And that is how it's happened. People wonder, scratch their heads, how, how did Israel become so unpopular? Because it glommed on to what is basically a Marxist paradigm. And of course, Marxism is way cool. I'm a professor. We love Marxism in academe, don't we? And isn't it true? Wasn't Marx right? All through history, it's the oppressors and the oppressed. Oppressors and the oppressed. And the poor Palestinians are the oppressed. The hatred of Israel has been described as the most widespread sentiment on the entire European continent. Because it crosses the whole political spectrum. From Marxist, yes, to far right. Boycott Israel, we know all about BDS. And here's that sign again, swastika equals star of David. Here's an ad promoting the Independence Party in Geneva, featuring a doll of a man wearing a yarmulke with an arrow in its head. Switzerland. The Norwegian labor youth called for an international boycott of Israel, employing anti-Semitic stereotypes. And all of this really allows the hatred of Jews to express itself in full force without having to worry about being labeled racist or even anti-Semitic, though obviously that's what it is. And there's an Arabic saying, first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. And sure enough, 
in the Arab world, places like Egypt in particular, we find attacks on Copts. We find Christians under attack. Christian Assyrians in Iraq under attack. Christians who, as we sadly recognized, really were at the heart of developing anti-Semitism for centuries, now today are themselves an oppressed class across the Middle East. And what about European Jews? They're being told you better disavow Israel. So free Palestine, Jews against the occupation. This is the only way a Jew in Europe is going to be safe. <laughs> if you say we're against the occupation, disavow Israel. Otherwise, you're not really trustworthy. Another Jew against Zionism. Real Jews denounce Israel's war crimes. I am, I am Jewish and I want Israel to stop killing Palestinians. Jews against U.S. military aid to Israel. Nice. See, by painting Jews as the evil ones, it tends to absolve previous generations of their own guilt. After all, didn't the Jews, don't the Jews really deserve it? This is in Turkey today. And we know Israel is the problem. And here's some interesting cartoon artwork in the Arab world. You see, these Jews are killing Christ again. And why did we mention that across Christian Europe, what was the charge? Jews are Christ killers. Not the same, but not different. And in the Middle East, so many have glommed on to these old anti-Semitic stereotypes like Christ killers. And we see it portrayed in the cartoons. Israel needs to be sacrificed in order to make the Muslim rage subside. And to legitimize that sacrifice, we'll viciously caricature Israel itself. There's even an anti-Israeli cartoons award. <laughs> well, I want to apply for that. Anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic anti cartoons <laughs> contest. Jews depicted as Nazis. And this is all over the internet. Absolutely vicious. And by the way, didn't the Europeans do a favor by killing six million Jews? God bless Hitler. Israel is the new Nazi state. Its destruction is legitimate, even desirable. And by the way, Mein Kampf is a bestseller in Palestinian territory. As well as in most Arab countries today. A survey was conducted. Do you think Jews abuse their status as victims of Nazism, as victims of the Holocaust? In France, 32.3% said yes. Italy, 40.2% yes. Germany, 48%. Poland, 72.2%. Survey asked, do you understand why people dislike Jews? Poland, 55.2%. Yeah, I understand. Germany, 48.9%. Italy, 40.2%. And several polls over the last decade indicate that Israel is the most dangerous country on earth tied with Iran. Most dangerous. They asked, is Israel conducting a war of extermination against Palestinians? And again, look at these cartoons. Absolutely hideous. 
Poland, 63% said yes. It's a war of extermination. Germany, 47.7%. They didn't ask, are you anti-Semitic? <laughs> Wonder what the respondents would have said. Oh, no, 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 I'm not anti-Semitic. Because today's anti-Semitism, the new anti-Semitism masquerades as a political movement against the Israeli government and Zionism. Folks, if silence gives consent, I think just maybe we've been consenting a bit too long. Giving a pass to anti-Semitism masquerading as anti-Zionism. This from Pat Condell, English-born writer and political commentator, just had to share a few words of wit. In Europe today, one of the many unfortunate consequences of pandering to the bigotry of Muslim immigrants has been a rise in anti-Semitism, not that Europe has ever needed much encouragement on that score. And this has breathed life into a whole host of previously dormant conspiracy casualties who would love to believe that Jews control the world. It seems like almost every day you know, I hear from somebody telling me that I should educate myself about Jews, how evil they are, how they manipulate everything so that they can control the world. Apparently, Jews are responsible for all kinds of horrible things, including 9-11, that goes without saying, and even the curse of multiculturalism. That's right, all those Jews who are being driven out of Europe by hate-filled Muslim immigrants are actually victims of a Jewish plot to destabilize the world so that they can control it, I guess. I don't know, I'm a little light on the details, but then most people are. <laughs> Compared to the number of Muslims and Christians on this planet, not to mention Hindus and Buddhists, Jews are a handful of people. They're a tiny percentage of the population. Nearly half of them live in Israel, a country the size of a county, and more are being driven there every day, especially from Europe, where it's become fashionable to use the Israeli government's behavior as an excuse for the kind of open anti-Semitism we've become used to hearing from Muslims. At anti-Israel demonstrations in Europe, you're likely to hear calls for Jews to be gassed. We've even had the spectacle of a Dutch member of parliament in the front line of such an event. In Sweden, Israeli athletes can no longer even compete without being attacked by violent mobs because the police can't or won't protect them. Hate crimes against Jews outnumber those against Muslims, and many of them are carried out by Muslims for no other reason than they've been taught from childhood to hate Jews. Meanwhile, day in and day out, we have to listen to their endless hypocritical about Islamophobia. It's enough to make you want to throw up. I support Israel's right to exist and to defend itself against people prepared to use women and children as human shields. I no longer believe that the Israelis should give back Jerusalem. But experience has taught us that the Islamic mentality views any concession as a weakness to be exploited further. And besides, too many so-called Palestinians seem less concerned with peace and freedom than with driving the Jews into the sea so the bombings wouldn't stop. The whole world knows there could have been a peaceful settlement many times in the past, but for incompetent and corrupt Palestinian leadership. Now, in Gaza, they've settled themselves with Hamas, a bunch of fundamentalist religious thugs who don't want peace at any price. For Hamas, the enemy is not Israel, the enemy is Jews. If you support Hamas, you support people who want to exterminate Jews, not for being Israelis, but for being Jews. And you support a culture where Jew hatred is bred right into the children. I hope you're proud of yourself. The fact that a Jewish state needs to exist at all, and it does need to exist, is an indictment of all humanity, and especially the Catholic Church, whose centuries-long program of aggressive Jew hatred has been ingrained right into the European psyche so that it takes almost nothing to bring it out. And that's why, if I were a Jew, even the non-Zionist, peace-campaigning, liberal Jew, and there are plenty of them, I would want to see a strong Israel, because when push comes to shove, people simply will not stand up for Jews. We've seen it historically in Europe, and in the wake of the Islamic invasion, we're seeing it again today, especially from the self-styled anti-fascists. What a joke you people are. The truth can often be painful when you don't want to hear it, but you're going to bloody well hear it anyway. And the truth is that Jews have contributed more to humanity than any other group of people. Way more than Muslims. 
vastly more than Muslims. We're talking different planet more than Muslims. <laughs> Jews receive a disproportionate number of Nobel Prizes because they're at the top of sciences, medicine, technology, you name it. Wherever there's progress in this world, you'll often find some Jew in there making all the difference. Israel today is a world technological leader, alone in the Middle East, like a diamond in a sea of mud. Compared to Jews, Muslims are passengers on planet Earth getting a free ride. Even the wealth of the Muslim world comes pouring straight out of the ground. If it didn't, they wouldn't have any. It's pathetic, and it's no wonder the Muslim world is so quick to petulant, childish anger. They must have a very poor self-image, and who can blame them? But they're the only ones who can do anything about it. They can choose to drag themselves into the 21st century and leave this filthy garbage behind, or they can carry on humiliating and degrading themselves with hysterical Jew hatred, and we'll carry on judging them on it as an embarrassment to the human race. I do hope that doesn't offend. As for you people who keep telling me that Jews control the world, you know, even if that were true, I would much rather that Jews control this world than Muslims any day, and so would every other sane person on the planet. But it isn't true, and I don't want to hear about it anymore if that wouldn't be too much trouble. So if you really believe that Jews are evil manipulators with their fingers in everyone's pie, or if you really believe that some sinister Jewish cabal is controlling you from above like a marionette, then please, don't tell me about it. Tell a doctor. But maybe not a Jewish one. <laughs> <laughs>
we have banded together, and that's always the way things work in a participatory democracy. I think we're on the right track, right here, right now. Yes, yes sir. Uh, you talk about anti-Semitism in the Quran. Yeah, uh, and there are some vicious passages in the Quran that we, that we know of. Uh, Zuri Jasser is familiar with vicious passages in the Quran. The thing is that texts need to be buffered by a community. And to be honest, there are a few passages in the Hebrew Bible that are not particularly wholesome, at least to a 21st century audience, right? The rebellious son to be stoned to death, okay. But that's why we have community. That's why we have religious community. So that we're not just taking a hot text and running with it. That's what extremists do. There are some vicious things in the Holy Quran, but believe it or not, there are some moderating passages in the Holy Quran. And everything needs to be read in context. And, and I think that what Zudi Jasser would say, he's a Muslim, so I have to defer to him, is, is that the Islamic community can be moderate, progressive, democratic, wholesome, and it needs to be. And the best place in the whole world to be a Muslim is the United States of America. So I think that's the way, the, the way he would answer it. Um, briefly, there's a passage in the book of Psalms that says, blessed be he who takes thy little ones and dashes them against the stone. You know, we're embarrassed about passages like that, all right? But we have a community that, that moderates them. And that takes wisdom, and it, it, takes, it takes an organization, it takes community. Yes, who else? All right, then. <laughs> the, yeah. What years were you there, Marjorie? Yes. In Lebanon. I was there in 1984, 1985, in Marjayun, in Marjayun, well, Lebanon. The, the television station was there, but the PLO were right over there on Balfour Castle. Yes, they were. A few miles away. Beaufort. Beaufort. Yeah. Not Balfour. Yeah, that's English. <laughs> that's like a, yeah. Yeah, the, the Beaufort Castle. We pass that all the time. Did it, you know Major Saad? Um, Saad Haddad, yes. Major Saad Haddad of Christian Free Lebanon, they call it, now crushed.